Let's get started. Uh, got a lot of stuff to cover. Um, good morning, everyone. First, as uh, Simon was saying, uh, my name is Ralph, and what I want to talk in the next hour is, is actually tell more of a story. Um, and in that story, it's a story of what I've been doing the last 15 years. It's a story of technology transfer. So my, um, I'll start with a bit of, oops, I'll start with a bit of background. Um, what is technology transfer? Um, why I'm talking about this topic, and and then I I want to go through two particular technology transfers that I've been had the pleasure um, to work with or or to be part of. Um, one of them um, concerns a ranking system for for people when they play online. So how many people here have uh, played on Xbox Live? Not that many. How many played? Uh, online on Xbox Live Halo. This is good, so I brought a video of this game because it seems that 95% of the audience doesn't know that game. So I'm going to talk about that aspect, and I'm also going to talk about a click-through rate prediction system that is, that is used now or has been used at the, some of the major search engines um, uh, and uh, major online services. But, but I want to use the opportunity to actually talk about and give a little bit of a tutorial of, of machine learning and of methods of machine learning that have really risen to prominence over the last 10 years. So the whole talk will be along a timeline, um, but it, I hopefully, um, I'm hopefully able to, to also shed a bit of light of the mathematics and how the mathematics translates into, into code for state-of-the-art machine learning systems. Um, and in the end, what I want to do then is summarize those two and talk a little bit about the lessons learned, both from a process point of view um, lessons for technology transfer when you have a kick-ass idea and you want to get it out to a million or 10 million people, and lessons learned on a technical level. Um, because machine learning these days is extremely popular, but it isn't, it isn't the hammer that solves every problem. So a bit of my background. So I'm from Berlin. Actually, I'm from Brandenburg, um, but I studied here in 90, from 92 to 2000. Um, I actually lived not far from here in uh, Corina Straße um, and I, at the Technical University, and what I studied is computer science. So I'm a uh, I've, I've been writing code since I was 11 years old and still continue to do, and then did my PhD in statistics. And at the time, the field machine learning didn't really exist as such, um, so it was more the field of artificial intelligence. So I then spent 11 year, uh, nine years, or 11 years in total, at Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Research in Cambridge, um, where, I, where most of uh, what I talk about in the story is going to be covered from, um, and then spent uh, a year at Facebook in Silicon Valley, um, in, in Palo Alto or in Menlo Park. And since last year, September, I'm back here in Berlin um, for many years to come, um, working at Amazon on the development center it's, that's just started here. So what is technology transfer? If you look at the wiki, it says it's the process of moving principal research or research topics into a level of maturity that it's ready for bulk manufacturing or production. Now, many people are super excited, particularly many scientists. And the problem is that it fails very, very often. And one of the reasons I think it fails is that publish, publishing an idea or making a breakthrough in science is not the same as producing, um, producing a product. Building a product has, has completely different goals and success and exit criteria. Secondly, there's really no training. Um, so you, in, in academia, you get good training on a technical level. There's no training on, on what to focus on for that process. Um, and it is, in all honesty, it is a little hard to generalize this process. So I'm trying to, so I try to think that I'm actually criticizing here, but it, um, it isn't a magical five-step procedure. You follow them and your idea will definitely end up in a product. Um, so let's start with the first, with the first case study, um, a system called TrueSkill. Um, given how, how many people play Xbox Live, I guess that name doesn't ring a bell. It's the official name for the ranking system. And so, that process started back in 2004. So in July, um, in June, July 2004, there was an internal beta test um, of a game called Halo 2. So this is the first person shooter. I'm going to have a video of a similar game later. Um, and a colleague of mine, Toro Grapple, and I, we were, we were playing this game. And as we played it, we were actually really into gaming, online gaming. We realized that graphically and from a network, it's super good. But what was really not well is who we got matched with, who we played with every night. And so we thought about it from a, from a statistical modeling or machine learning point of view. What is the problem that we're trying to solve here? And so when you, when you try to formalize this, the problem is that at the end of a match, you have the outcome of the match of K teams. So here's an example. We have two teams, a red team and a blue team. Um, and they have a particular score. So in this game, they shoot at each other. 
Um, so in this, came, in this particular case, the red team won over the blue team. So that's what you know. Which team had how many points at the end of a, of a game? This could be a racing game or a shooting game or a game of chess. And you know which players are in which teams. And one thing that was particular is that there were many different kinds of games. So you didn't have just two team games. You had to build a system in that, ga in that, in that particular instance that would also cover eight people playing against each other. And then the possibility of some of them drawing because they have the same number of points. Okay? And the, cha the challenging thing is that this is the data you have. The data is who played and which team, which teams played against each other. And you needed to um, associate or find or learn a number um, for each player, a skill number, that had the property that if a skill of player I is bigger than the skill of player J, then the probability that that player will win when they, when they, when they paired up against each other is, la is larger. Doesn't mean they win all the time, but it means it's, it's, it's more likely. And so, why is that important? That's important for two reasons. It was clear we wanted to know of the two of us who's the better. Um, but more importantly, it's very important when you want to match people against each other. When you look at an online universe today, there's usually hundreds of thousands of people simultaneously live online being able to play against each other, but only, no, they could not judge what is a good match for them. Um, so if you do it on a global scale, you need a system that is able to pick the best combination of four, six, two, eight players that play against each other. Um, so really what you want to do is you have these match outcomes. That's your data. Who plays against whom? And you want to kind of interleave them so you get to a global ordering that's somewhat consistent with the local orderings. You have the subset of players. So that's the mathematical problem. And so um, what we did is then in, the, in September that, that beta test stopped and we started to think, OK, how can we build a model for this, a machine learning model? And what we started with is a probabilistic model. So for the next, literally the next three months only, till December of 2004, that was 10 years ago, we, we built that. And so the model we had in mind, we're thinking, well, what we, if, suppose we know what my skill is and, and Taurus skill. Then there is a probability that each of us has a particular performance in a match. So you see the distribution on the right. And we know that from that performance, we can work out how likely is the blue player to win, let's say that's me, and the red player. Because that's nothing more than the area under this curve, so that's a particular Gaussian integral. So you can solve that. And then we thought, well, in a game like uh, Xbox Live, there's many modes. There's not just two players, not like chess. So how can we generalize this to two teams? And we made the simplest possible assumption, which is that the performance of a team is the sum of the performances of its players. So you have these performance variables. They end up being something in memory. And then you have the same, um, the same model, given the two performances of team one and team two. The team with the higher performance is more likely to win because you have these Gaussian blobs and you get a Gaussian integral um, for that team performance um, one being bigger than the performance of team two. But again, we had teams, of, we had actually to cover a situation where we had more than two teams. So what did we do there? Well, Intuitively, you would do the most natural thing. You would say the team's performance is the sum of the skill of the uh, sum of the performances of its players. But now you have a very large number of outcomes. Even with, with three teams, you already have six possible outcomes. All permutations of team one wins over team two over team three, team one over team three over team two, and so forth. So that looked very difficult to solve or to, to sample. But then we realized we don't have to do this. We have the data. The one thing that's certain, and that's the interesting thing in machine learning, is you have the data. What you don't have is these numbers s. So what used to be fixed in our model is not what we, it's actually fixed. What's actually fixed is the match outcome. At the end of a, of a shooting match, we know which of the three teams came first, came second, and came third. So when you do that, you actually make the skill variable something that you, that you don't know, that the model has to estimate. And you make the outcome, one beats two, and at the same time, team two beats team three, um, the, the observations. And you end up with these very simple trees. And so what we implemented is known as a, uh, as a Markov sampler, as a Monte Carlo sampler. So simply assuming at the end of a match, this team won over this team, this team won over this team, we implemented a random sampler that would generate how likely is S1, S2, S3, and S4 to be of a given number provided that we throw, all, throw away all the samples where the skills are not in the right order according to the match outcome. So we implemented this, but then we realized we had two problems to solve. One is we had to solve the, the ranking problem, and now what we end up with is a distribution over skill, something that is uh, not, some, it's not a number. So when you do that, we wonder, well, if we have to decide on a global ordering, what kind of mistakes could we do? There's two types of mistakes we can do. We could either 
because we had too little data, um, match outcome data, we could either put a bad player at the top of a leaderboard, or we could put a good player, a real good player, at the bottom of the leaderboard. So which one of the two do you think is, uh, is the worst of the two mistakes to do? A bad player on top or a good player at the bottom? The, why? That's right, that's right. But, but if I ask you in Formula One who's currently the 18th in the standing, can you name me that? But if I ask you who's the, currently the top of the leaderboard, I'm sure you can name me that. Most people focus on the top of a leaderboard, even those that are not very good. So if you want to have a legitimate leaderboard, you've got to make sure the top is accurate and there's not bad player in there. So that's why we decided um, for an asymmetric loss, and what you end up doing is when you sort people, you look at their mean skill, their variance, and you subtract the two. It's a very simple equation to implement, and then you sort. So that was extremely simple to sort. The second thing we had to do is we had to do matchmaking, which is N players, like 100 players, are online at the same time. Which two are the best match? And we used a very intuitive equation that is, uh, is a closed-form closed form equation that you can work out is basically saying for two players IJ that are currently live and can play online, what's the probability that they have the same performance? And we normalized this by assuming we had identical players, same mean skill, same, no more uncertainty about their skill. So if you do that, then you get something that, is, um, that gives for gamers something exciting because it's, uh, it's the kind of match where the outcome isn't determined until the end of the match. But also, when you look at an information theory, it's the most informative outcome. It's something, it's the match that creates, that gives the best information. So, after three months, all the work was done. So, it was merely a question of a few months until this would be out in the hands of gamers. Well, that's not entirely true. You can guess that, uh, given, that the, given the arrow, it's going to go for, on for a little longer. So, in the next three months, we literally wrote the code I just described and incorporated it into the code base of, of Xbox Live which was going to go live in November that year. So we knew that the launch date was November 2005 of, of the old Xbox Live service and the last generation of Xbox. But what happened now is um, the game developers, the people who actually make the silicon into something useful, they needed to understand what this new ranking system is and how it works and how they can fine tune in their games. So we spent an entirety of six months not writing any code, not doing any research, but having to go around and talk with all the launch developers how to use this new system, how to show skills, how to, um, you know, how to trade off waiting time in the lobby and match quality. Because the match quality, all this was probabilistic, it was pretty accurate, but it was unknown. It was not something, even the APIs weren't, weren't, uh, weren't exactly the same as they used to be before. So then in November, the game launched, and something good happened and bad happened. The good thing that happened is that Xbox Live became extremely popular, more popular than we thought. We had implemented this sampler, and this sampler was very slow. I mean, we, we estimated perhaps a million people come online, but it was, it was growing so fast that it was clear that if we don't speed this up, then by three months in, we wouldn't have the code wouldn't be able to execute on the matchmaking server anymore, or on the ranking server. So we needed to do something to speed this up. And this is when we went back to the drawing board and actually did some research for, uh, for a couple of months. And it's a methodology that is, uh, it's proven extremely powerful, so I want to go a little deeper here. Um, something that I've been using ever since, and, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's something that relates nicely to, to computation as well, and to coding. Um, it's a framework called Factor Graph. So you, you saw these graphs, right, these variables. They ended up just being storage. You just store this in, in memory or in, or in registers. But now, in, in a factor graph, you also represent the factorial relation, the product relation between two any sets of variables when you have a probability distribution over match outcomes or over skills. So a simple thing, it's actually just graphical. So if you have a factor graph over three variables, A, B, C, and it looks like that, that really just means that rather than having an arbitrary function P, probability of, of all data, you actually have something that factorizes in a factor of A, a factor of B, and the third factor connects, uh, uses all the three variables. So it just says how many factors do I have and how many variables does each factor really interact with. And where does that become important? It becomes important in our example here because in Bayes' law we knew that uh, what we really computed is the probability of the skills given the match outcome. And when you look in the textbook, that's just the probability of the match outcome given the skills times the probability of the skills. So that's two factors. That's the first factor. That's the second factor. Then we realized we don't have an arbitrary relationship between them. What we do is we actually assume that all the skills of people are independent. So skill one, skill two are independent of each other, meaning we have a, a set of factors for each of, the, for each of the variables. We also realized that we have a rather linear flow of forward flow of what we think 
makes, makes, a make, makes a game end up in a win or a loss for a player, which is that each skill is connected to a performance of the team. The performances of the team are connected to a difference simply by taking the difference of them, and the difference being positive results in one player winning, the difference being negative in the other. So you have this graph here, and the, the computation that you have to do that was too slow was the computation of summing out the variables, team variables and the difference variables. If you, know, if you don't have these variables, then mathematically you have just computed the, what, a, what a machine can best think about as the best skill estimate for a player. And turns out that this summation can be done a lot faster than simply generating random samples of S1, S2, and then throwing all of them away um, that don't result in, in, the, in the data that you actually observe the match outcome. And here's, a, here's how that works. So imagine I just turned this thing on its head. Imagine we have four factors and five variables, V, W, X, Y, and Z. And what we want to compute is what's the, um, what's the distribution over W. So all we, need to, uh, all we need to do is we sum over V, X, Y, and Z. So if you do this in a naive way, you can see that this is, uh, is non-computable. It becomes NP-hard because this is an exponential number of, of summons that you have to do. So for every value of V, let's say it's only two values. That would already be 16 summons, 2 by 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. And if I have many more variables, we, have, we had over a million gamers, and many, you know, even with eight gamers, you already have too much state to sum over. But one thing that's interesting when you look at this, at this graph, the picture, you can see that W is really only involved in two factors, F1 and F2. It doesn't really matter what F3 and F4 is. And algebraically, you can see that we can take one factor, which is the factor of 1, and then the other factor, the other set of variables on the right, and we just turned a sum of products into a product of sums. And if we simply introduce a shorthand notation, something that we, a temporary storage for, for this function, so this is still a function of W, this is still a function of W, after summing out X, Y, and Z, we now get one of the first relationships is when you want to compute the, the marginal, when a machine wants to compute the marginal of a variable, it just needs to, su to take the product of these neighboring functions m, that neighboring to the variable uh, to the factors of this of this variable, and how is the equation looking for that message? Um, same thing again. F2 as a factor has only two variables, w and x. Y and z are not variables of F2, so that means we can again use the same trick and make this sum of products into a product of sums. Um, here's the product. Um, it's just called distributive law, but what's nice is if we now introduce a shorthand notation for this term we see that all we need to do in any given factor, we just need to do a computation along the edge um, by summing out, the, summing out each of the possible variables that it's connected to and weighting them by this message. And this message, we've already seen how to decompose that, is just the product of these incoming messages that we just defined. So if you put these three together, you saw how I peeled this graph away. You see that the number of computations that I actually need to do is only as many as I have edges. And these ranking graphs have very few edges. Overall, we may have a million players, but each game has only as many edges as people participating. So this actually, when you implemented this, and would implement this, this would compute um, the, the margin or the posterior of this variable in, in linear time rather than exponential time. Um, the, only, the only tricky thing is that even these operations are extremely simple to do if, if the message, uh, if these functions m, are what known as closed under product, meaning the, when you take a product, you can just re uh, reduce it to parameter updates. This message equation doesn't have that property. So the only thing we need to do is what can we do um, in message passing when we have messages like the last one at the bottom you saw, where if I win the game, then only those, only those performance differences which are positive are justified by the data. All the others have zero justification. So if you multiply these two together, let's say it was a Gaussian, then you don't get a Gaussian anymore. But all you're doing is um, you just approximate that Gaussian by the closest possible Gaussian you can, you can store. And the nice thing is when you approximate a Gaussian, you just store two numbers, a mean and a variance. Um, and then what you can work out is uh, the, the thing to solve is what's the best approximation for this red curve here, which we need a lot in the ranking, it's not actually in, uh, any approximation to a, to a step function. It is just another Gaussian, because if you multiply that blue Gaussian by that red Gaussian, which is a horrible approximation when you just look at it in pictures, you get something that's very close to this approximation, so, so it's extremely accurate. And how did we use that? Well, here's the graph again from before. Three teams. One team has two players. They played against each other. We know that this player is very good. He beat this team of two. 
this team of two beat this single player. We turn this into a factor graph, so that's just that way. And then we perform, we see that the product of these factors is what we might call a prior. The product of these factors, summing out the t variables, is what we might call a likelihood. So we're back to base, base rule. But if you implement now just the code for, these, for the updates on the arrows, and uh, we've done that, so if you go online, you can actually download that code. There's many implementations, that's one of them in F-sharp. Um, it's, it's a couple of hundred lines long. It's literally just implementing the equations I, I talked about before that store a mean and a variance in each of, the, in each of these variables um, and just update the mean and variances on each of these variables. This is known as a schedule, but think of it as this is just how the code gets composed. Um, you're actually having a machine build a machine learning system that solves um, for the best possible skill uh, for the best possible skills of the of the gamers. Now, by December we should be finished with that transfer. But the reality was is we had to implement that. Um, that took three months. The reality was that many many games had a hard time still um, adopting and knowing how their community looked like. So the next thing we needed to do is actually develop a tool that helped game developers to see. How is my population of gamers that plays my game? How is that actually um, that population? Um, how is that spreading out over the skill skill access that we have? And and how 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 narrow, how complicated is my game? So what we needed to do, even though we were kind of more in for the research, is we needed to write a project that would scrape the application, the matchmaking servers, and reconstruct. What's the skill distribution in every single game, in every single session, at every single hour? Because what we observed is that people were saying, this, this doesn't work. I'm still playing against people that are much better than me, or much, wor much, uh, much worse. And what we realized, and only after we've built this tool, so here's how the tool looked. This is all written in F-sharp, um, used at a time, um, used bin forms, um, so it scrapes them, and now you could see what's the, um, so what's the how many sessions on every hour of the day that we have. <laughs> So I think I, uh, and I'm from which countries. One thing you see is that there were times in the day where there were very few gamers online. So there simply wasn't a good match available. And, and that data wasn't visible before. And it wasn't something that was necessarily planned because the math says this is the best possible match. But if you have no candidate to be matched with that's of good skill, you still get a very, very bad matchmaking experience. And so as a result of this um, and, and realizing that only the very popular games really have enough gamers at any given hour, um, we actually were able to, to give some advice on what to do to prolong the waiting time in the lobby. Um, one other interesting side effect was is that we could measure the complexities of game. So, when you, so we always, uh, the, the, the skills were numbers that were scaled between 0 and, and 50. One thing we realized is uh, there was a game on the market, this was a, a golf game, where people played 18 holes. A single session lasted for about an hour when you played it online. But it, this hour meant that the slightest difference in skill really realizes in the best player winning. So 50 levels weren't actually enough to represent the, the various chains of skills between players. On the other hand, we saw a game like Uno, which um, arguably has no skill, because it's just a, a game of chance. Um, and this real, uh, realized himself, this is one of the most popular racing games that really it was well designed for that. Most gamers were fitting on this 50, uh, 40 levels was the active range, were fitting on the 50 level scale. There's also a slight bias at zero, because most people were new. Give us a good sense of how many new gamers are coming. Um, now what happened is, um, this helped game developers a lot, but, um, and we, we again went out and met with a lot of them, um, Epic Games and, and on boards. So we didn't do any research, we didn't do any code. But by June, there was sort of a tipping point. No major game had, had been using it. Um, and so we had realized that if the major game on the Xbox platform, Halo 3, isn't going to use it, then we have a hard time for the developer community to see that this is a system that really makes a, for a good matchmaking experience when you use it. So we started to work with Bungie, which started, uh, the team started to, to build that game for the platform, for the Xbox Live platform, that early on. It launched about a year and a half later. And so in that, what we, the first thing we had to do is we simply had to see, had to answer the question, if we had used Halo 3, uh, if we had used true skill in Halo 2, how accurate would every, everyone's skill have been? How accurate could we have predicted the matches that happened? Because by that time, Halo 2 came out here, right? Remember, this was actually the starting point of the project. Um, we had over 400 million matches of over six, I think at the time, six million people. So this was a huge, I mean, this is before Hadoop, or just about the birth of Hadoop. There wasn't much distributed computer around. 
Um, so it's a huge amount of data. Um, we analyze things in a, in a, in a, in a SQL database still. Um, and I've been talking about Halo 3 a lot, so let me, let me just show um, how the game looks and so, so you have a sense of what triggered this project. Um, so when you start Halo, that's the start screen, um, you see two options. You can play the career, or you can play the uh, campaign, or you can play matchmaking. When you choose matchmaking, you can choose any of these game modes. So here's the ranked lists. So there's lone wolves, six players against each other, team slayer, two players of three to four people each, team doubles. So you choose, you have a si single level that you see. In the game, this is from the game, you can actually see the distributions of skills, something that we've built before. Bungie took this on board and actually made this visible so people saw how many people were around to match with. And then when you, when you selected matchmaking, it would actually go into a lobby. You would wait for, at most, two minutes. This is how I speed it up a bit. So now you're matched against people. And one thing you should see is total experience is the number of games played and ranked matches, uh, sorry, ranked matches number of games played. And you always get an experience point if you win. So look at the ratio. That's from a live session, OK? It's about one to two. That's what the game is like. So you play in teams or alone. You're, you're a soldier in some alien world, um, for those who haven't played it. And the thing that people really like about this game, I mean, it's very tactile, but what keeps them coming back is what you see in the bottom right. So this is the score of the red team, this is the score of the blue team. Okay? So what people really like why they come back is if, it that, if it's that tight. So they get matched with some random three people against some random other four people. Um, and in a 10-minute match, they, they really are fighting it out, and it's, it's extremely tight. So you get a sense of, like, you shoot at each other. It's actually really fun. I mean, I wasted a minimum of three months of my whole life just playing this. Okay, so that's, that's Halo 3. So what we needed is, as I said, we needed this, this tool that actually first showed, demonstrated for us and for the game developer, Bungie, um, that that was that was actually, um, it was working. It would have given us accurate skill estimates if we had used it. So if we, we wrote this, and at the time there was no distributed uh, framework, so we had to distribute, had to do all the .NET remoting, uh, distributed compute ourselves. So we analyzed over 8 billion matches that already had happened in different settings of some of the parameters and with respect to drawing and not drawing and how quickly players progress. So just the logs produced 52 gigs of data and just looking at them. So this was all happening, there was no Halo 3 written. Um, was something that needed a result viewer. And so, as the researchers, we wrote this. Um, so, it gives you a sense how this looked. So, you could go in and you could choose the hyperparameters, and you could now see over the skill levels, sorry, over the number of games played, how would this level progression have been for the very good players or the not so good players? Had we used it, how would their skill levels have progressed? And we could see at any given time what's the distribution of skill levels. Because one thing that was important is that people weren't progressing so fast. The system was so accurate. This was far too fast. Um, something that um, no one was really happy with. If, if after 20 matches, you would already, or 30, 40 matches, you would already be at the high level, you would be not having this level of experience as a gamer. And you wouldn't necessarily trust that you were, you wouldn't start playing because you would worry that if I don't make the fast progression, I'm never going to get there. That's not true. but. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't put those extra 20 games in. And so people would not play the online mode. Um, again, lots of, uh, lots of little, little side projects to do. For example, one thing we needed is um, we needed a spline, spline for the dampening. So one thing, one thing we had to introduce is slow down the inference. And we did that by dampening, and we needed to do it smoothly. So um, that was an, an interesting side project. So by May 2007, we were actually, we had another two months of research, we were actually able to now incorporate it into a public beta. So before Halo 3 came out, 1.3 million people actually played the game for two reasons. I mean, one was to test the code base, um, but the two main reasons was to check the network code. So even if you play transatlantic games, um, what's the latency? And did all our simulations that happen here, did they actually hold true when we put this into the game? So the only thing you could play is the online, going, uh, the online mode. Um, so we needed to develop one more tool um, for, for Bungie. And that tool was something that allowed them, that allowed the game design, online game designer, to actually set the curves of dampening as a, as a function of number of games played, skill level, and match quality. So even if you made a bad match, you didn't, didn't necessarily want that to affect your, skills so, uh, your skill estimate so much. And then we could see in, uh, from the beta what the skill, what the attribution, I mean, you see this graph in a minute, how many people that are on a given skill have lost or won all their games in the beta. 
So the ultimate test for did this system actually work, and the ultimate get-go, two and a half years later, was actually taking the beta, taking this 1.3 million gamers, and then looking at them and saying, well, if this system works, we should see two properties. The, far, the good gamers should converge to the best skill within roughly 100 games. That was the design parameter. And secondly, if we look at number of games played, so if you played one game, half the people lost that game, half the people won that game, a few, a few, two, um, a few players drew because the time ran out. But one thing that should be true is it should be a good matchmaking, it should be a good ranking system, so the number of games that people win and lose, the, the, ratio, the, the fraction of games, should be 50-50. So if I press go on here, you see the video, and what it does is it looks at all the people that have played n games. So, so far this is 1.3 million. So there's only 500,000 left that played two games in the beta, and so forth. So in the end, we're looking at 3,000 people that played 300 games in these six weeks that the beta was on. Um, but what's the, and you see a plot, you see a dot, and the dot is always, what's the fraction of games won, and what's the skill level of that, what's the strength of that player? So what, what should that graph look like for a good ranking system? Should it be a, should it be a diagonal line? So if this, so if this is a diagonal line, that would be a random matchmaking system, because that means that if you're really bad, you lose all your games. Not an experience you want to create for people. That's not fun. And if you're really good, you win all your games. What you want is a bar. A bar means a bar at 50% eventually, because that means that regardless of your skill level, you win and lose half your games. Perhaps there's a stretch where you win some and lose, but overall you win and lose half your games. So this is, the, this is actually the real data. This is um, quite a lot of data in the video. Um, this is all the match outcomes from 1.3 million people that played um, up to 300 games. So now you're seeing at 100 games, roughly, the best people have reached the top level. It took a while. And now this one is, gonna, is going to become more and more of a bar. It flickers more because there's less and less people that played 200, 300, and so forth games. So it's, it's, less, it's much more coarse now. And the reason it's not at 50 exactly is because draws count like a half win. So... Um, like a half loss, so that's why it's a, bit, it's a bit shifted. So that meant, that was actually good news for us, because that meant that, this is 300 games, um, at the end, even people claiming on, on boards and blogs that, you know, this sucks, I win all the games, I lose all the games. It's just not true. Like, not, this, there's not a single dot I left out. There's no gamer in this big pro uh, collection that actually lost more than 80% of their games, or won more than 60% of their games. So the... The service launched um, in 2005, I talked about that one, and Halo 3 launched two years later, and for the longest time it was one of the most popular online video games on a console. Um, I think it's now superseded by others, but at peak times the game had, um, had one million people continuously playing online. Um, so, when you look at that line, it's actually pretty long, considering uh, that, that we started with this just with a hunch and wanting to build this for ourselves. And the lessons learned here was that if you look at the red bars, that's the smallest one. Research takes the smallest time in, a tra in this transfer, about six months um, when, you, when you add them all up. And all of the development wasn't necessarily the algorithm. It was a lot of tools that we needed to develop. And one big fraction was evangelization. You know, a platform only lives if it has a community. This is a platform feature. If the developers that need to use this platform feature can't use it because it's not well explained, or it's, 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 it has the wrong API, it has the wrong parameters to tune, it's not going to get adoption. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, for ourselves, this idea of the most optimal match wasn't necessarily something that people wanted. It was a hard lesson for us to learn that even though this system was information theoretically optimal, it learned extremely well. We, could, we, could even, we even showed that it was close to the information theoretic minimum uh, limit, meaning you couldn't design a ranking system that, given this data, can learn more accurate skills. That doesn't mean it's fun. That might scare you away if you're jumping 10 levels and at the first game. So dampening it down and making it slower was actually really important. Um, so mathematical optimality doesn't actually mean fun for a, for, for a gamer or customer. So second example is a bit shorter. is on a ranking system which is known as AdPredictor. So the paper was published in 2010 for more details. Just going to touch up on it. The, the, it started a little bit uh, pretty much after this one, the first one finished. And what happened is that in, uh, 
In the first three months, we kind of uh, got familiar with the problem. We first needed to understand what's the problem. The problem was, so this is back out of the day, um, my life search was one of the search engines. When you type a search query like Seattle into a search box, you get this green block and you get this yellow block of content back. And they differ in so far as those are clearly marked as sponsored results and those are non-sponsored results. What does that mean? That means someone's paying for the, for the results that are shown in uh, that are shown in yellow. In fact, let's suppose Seattle American Airlines, what's this American Airlines? American Airlines pays, this is fictitious figures, pays a dollar. Um, this, this site pays two dollars, and this site pays only 10 cents. So why are they in this order? The reason they're in this order is because they only pay when a click happens, meaning they get someone to their site, and the guy, or uh, the, the person potentially buys a trip with, with American Airlines. So what the platform has to do, it has to estimate these, science, these, uh, these, these numbers. It has to estimate how likely is a person going to click on American Airlines, when we show American Airlines now. Um, that's going to make the value of that customer, when he gets to American Airlines site, is $1. American Airlines said this. Um, but Life Search estimates that that will happen with 10%. So the effective value for American Airlines of showing this is $0.10. Cents. Okay? Now, that explains why the order is how it is. What it doesn't explain is, um, what it doesn't answer yet is, if the click happens, should we charge, should this platform charge American Airlines a dollar? Question. Should they pay the dollar that they put in a bid? Who thinks yes? Okay. What happens if they go to 90 cents? They change their bid to 90 cents. So if they change their bid to 90 cents, nothing happens for them. They're still going to be shown there. 90 cents times 10% is 9 cents. So that means they still get the same impression. They get the same number of people. The customer can't see this difference. So what's really the case is, is that you should, when you charge the dollar, you incent this, this advertiser to actually go and not say how valuable is the customer but say how valuable is the customer minus the value of the customer of the second highest bidder. So what you should really charge is 80 cents. And how did we arrive there? Well, we basically equated 10 cents with 8 cents and then worked out what would that bid have to be for this to be 8 cents. Because then something would happen. If the advertiser is, charged, um, is, is bidding less than 80, then they lose their position and they get less clicks. Okay? So probabilities are important because it's important to display. So you need to have the bits that are not set by, the bits are set by advertisers, and you need to multiply them with the probability that has to be estimated. And for the charge, for the charge, you basically, as we just did, is we just said, um, this bid is too high. So what charge C1 have to be in order for C1 times P1 to be exactly that value? And when you solve that one, it's the second bid times the ratio of probabilities. Okay? So that's how probabilities occur. So they, if you have better probability estimates, makes more happy users because you don't show them ads that they don't want to see, um, makes more happy advertisers because you charge them more fairly, and overall you can show that it's actually increasing the overall revenue. Um, so what happened in March is that there was a, a competition internally launched, and so for three, three months we actually did a lot of research on what, what systems could we use. And a lot of the research um, was actually more focused, one lesson we learned is that the quality of the data Makes a, makes a big difference, meaning the, how do we represent, how does an algorithm see an ad, and see the user, and see the context, the browser, and all that. Um, oops, that's meant to be the search page. Um, so the people see the search page, this is how the, the logs, it's just raw numbers of which IP, um, you know, what time of the day, what ads were there, what the ID of the advertisers. So the first thing we did is, we actually needed to translate this into structured objects. What was the advertiser? What was the campaign? What was the order? What was the ad? What was the text in the ad? What was the time of the day? What was the, the, the user? So we extracted that and spent a lot of time in parsing, but also making this fully automated. So we validated the data, cleaned it, and, and had a very automated way of allowing us to write this code and then use it in production. So what we, what we actually spend half of the time of the project on is writing a, a uh, schema generator. What I mean by this is, we wrote the uh, structured information that we wanted to know. So, what medium was it? Um, give you an idea. Uh, what was the advertiser ID? 
Um, what was the gen inferred gender of the user? What was the query string that the user typed? So all this was part of this long log. So what we did is we, we wrote these types and then wrote custom parsers for them. So it was the actual bid, the match type, exact or not exact, and so forth. And then we wrote a library that just allowed us to point to the raw CSV file, um, do the parsing, but then compute simply from the type the entire SQL schema. So this is this little command, bulk build, that would point to a server, to a table, um, and a, and a subtable name. And that schema now allows to simply insert. Um, so this is um, F sharp is a bit like OCaml. Think of it as OCaml. Um, just to insert these strongly, uh, these strongly typed objects. But it did it at such a, so we could, we could do this in SQL. We could actually look at that data. But it did it at such a high speed that we could also use it in production, the actual, um, in the actual code that ran when it trained from the, from the massive amounts of data. We didn't have to write two types of code, one for data analysis and one for, one for visualizing the data when we insert it into a SQL server. Um, the model was extremely simple. I don't want to go too deep, but it's, the model is very related to, to um, the model we used for gamers. We were basically thinking each of the aspects of an ad and of a user and of the context, it's a bit like a player in a, in a team. So we have players that are representing the user. We have players that represent the match type of the ad. We have players that represent the position where it was shown. And what happens is that the particular value of this player, the particular player, so it wasn't the main line, the first one, and it wasn't a, a broad match, so the, the keyword that the advertiser bought wasn't exactly the, 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 the query that was typed by the, by the user um, and the IP. There was a particular configuration of players that played together, and if the click happened, they won the game against zero, and if the click didn't happen, they lost the game against zero. So it's a very similar mathematics I showed you before, um, which gives you a distribution over probabilities of click, and all you need to store in a model is actually just these skills or these mean variances of, in, in statistics, they're called effects. So code was, was very similar. Um, so by May 2007, you'd think all of, the, all of this all work is done. But first of all, we needed a real evaluation. And this one was, this time, you couldn't avoid. So what this time was is literally the fairest possible comparison I can think of in that every researcher didn't have to submit some offline results, like in Kaggle. But you had to submit code. And that code would now be run in shadow, in parallel, on data that's only generated in May. So this data was actually not available. The, the actual clicks, non-clicks, generated at the time of the evaluation. And so by August of that year, it was clear which, which was the most accurate and also which was the simplest system that wouldn't run out of memory, wouldn't run out of compute. So what you see here is a visualization of the accuracy. That was the existing system at the time. And, and to give you a sense how this is generated, um, the way this is generated, um, is that you take each particular ad that was shown, or, and then it was clicked or not clicked. The system, you know, you give the ad, computes a probability of click. This is a real number, between 0 and 100%. So you take that number, and you discretize it, in this case, in one of 1,000 buckets. Okay? So it was either 0.1, 0.2%, 0.3%, 0 004 so 1,000 buckets over millions of, millions of predictions means that each of these buckets ends up having a lot of examples falling into them. And then, because it was all happened in the past, it's, it's for evaluation, you know for each bucket what's the actual empirical ratio, the actual ratio of clicks. So if you have, let's say this is an, it's an order of tens of millions, tens of millions of these lines, and you put them in 1,000 buckets, each of them have enough examples in there that you get a good, um, good sense of how uh, a good estimate of the actual click-through rate. And the size of the bubble is proportional to how many things fell in that bucket. Okay? So what you see here is the 45 degree line is what you're after. You're after a system that when it says 16.5%, then in 16.5% of the time that the system says this, a click actually happens. The customer actually goes for it. Um, so it was actually fairly accurate. And another nice effect is, remember this team setting? We had these teams of... of uh, users, so at the time IP, you could actually see for each player, so to speak, um, or statistics, each effect, how likely, what's their mean, and what's their variance, how likely are they to click, lead to a click, and not click. So those were understandable. These were people, they never clicked on ads. And there were lots of them. So there's the bubble plot. But then there were also these people, very few, but there were people that whenever they saw an ad, they would click on it, always. And the reason this is actually an interesting one is because the incentive structure is a bit skewed here. If you're, 
if your advertiser runs out of budget because um, someone clicked on all the links, on all the ads whenever they appeared, then you get to pay much less because now there is no one that you compete with, so you can go in with a lower bid. So this was actually sort of a, a false industry of clicking on competitors' ads in order to deplete their budget in order for you to not pay as much for an ad. Okay, so we're already, uh, already nine months in. So what happened now is that everything was developed for single machine learning, but the stream of, of data was even bigger than that of online games. So now we need to spend a lot of time mapping this, bring this whole system onto MapReduce, because we didn't design it for that scale at the beginning. And what, the way we did that is, so we have this mathematical, this factor graph again, where we have a probability of the parameters um, here, and then each data, think of them as chunks of data, is like a factor um, given the parameters, given the, what the parameters simply are, is the, the means and variances of all possible um, effects. Um, you know, we, the message passing would say you compute those messages, send them here, you send this message, multiply, you have your result. But the problem is none of this, all of this computation can't happen on a single machine. So the way to map this to MapReduce is that in the map stage, you actually send those messages, which is just the prior, to each of the machines that hold a chunk of the data, okay? And in the reduce step, um, each of them computes the message that the amount of information that's in the data sends this back over, the, over files into the reducer. The reducer would then combine by simply multiplying those messages, which is, when you look at the code, it's just adding two numbers, um, together for each of the possible values, for each of the possible feature values that it has seen in the chunk of data it processed. Um, and that would give you, um, if everything was accurate inference, would actually give you the, the posterior and the best possible solution. Everything being file-based is not necessarily super fast, but at least it scales. Um, one of the challenging things is these are approximate factors, so you need to do some tricks, because if you do the approximation, then now you do the approximation in parallel, um, and, and you can actually show that the approximation gets uh, consecutively bad if you really do have many mappers, so you want a minimum number of mappers. Um, so there was some work needed to deal with approximate message passing, and you needed to make sure that while well, you want the mappers uh, big, you do need to have no more parameters and fit in a single machine in order to multiply them together. So it was a limit on the size of the data. But after about um, six, seven months um, that was done, one thing that was needed now for three months is to assess how much impact will that system actually have on revenue. And that was really hard because we could assess how accurate is the click-through rate, but what effect it would have on the bids and how would advertisers change their bids is something where some, some work in, uh, in, game, in game theory was necessary. So what we do then, and I'm not going to go into the details, we had to develop for the next uh, six months, we had to develop tools that to maintain such a model, to be able to roll back, to be able to visualize, because this would, would run in a more automated fashion day by day, um, what parameters have changed how much, because when advertisers came back and said my campaign didn't show, we needed to have an explanation as to why. And so by March 2009, a whole two years later, it actually went, went live, and when live search changed to Bing, that system I described was, was the system that went live for all the ads on Bing for the coming years. Um, lessons learned here. Again, research is actually the shortest amount of time. Tool development is hugely underestimated. In this particular instance, it was important to develop for scale. We had developed for a single machine setting, but what we hadn't anticipated is that the amount of data became so large. And today, this isn't, so, this isn't the problem that a Microsoft or a Facebook or an Amazon only have. I think more and more people are getting, getting so much data that the design for scale is, is something extremely important. So if you put these bars next to each other, one thing that you see is um, problem identification does take some time. Understanding what the problem is. Um, in this case, it was simply being passionate and playing. Um, also here, knowing why do we need probabilities. is not just, you know, it's not a black box that just seems to spit out probabilities, but they have value, and what can the probabilities be influenced by? Tool development is uh, it's hugely underestimated, so coding is extremely important. But the, the thing that... Uh, sort of a surprise to us almost the most in true scale cases, how much time, this is more than a year of our time going into evangelization, working with the engineers, the customers, the product managers, the developers if it's a platform feature, and, and understanding what the, what the challenges is in, in using the interface. So lessons learned. I think process lessons, there are six. Um, and and since then or ever since, I've been, been using them a lot. The first one I would say is, um, there's a temptation as a, as a researcher to put the technique, the, the, com the complexity of the technique ahead of the problem. 
Um, and the best way to avoid it is to be your own customer. So I didn't want to see many ads. I was a customer there, and I absolutely love video gaming. So that's something that's highly motivating, and but also makes you focus on the experience rather than on is this a complex algorithm or is this state of the art or not. The second thing, um, and that's I think that's interesting for for uh, a lot of uh, a lot of researchers is in neither of these two cases we studied the existing literature, and that actually I think is a healthy thing. I think you shouldn't. I mean, you're not going to make a breakthrough by reading what others did in a textbook and re-implementing it. If, you're, if, if you kind of want to make a difference, then it's, it's, not, it's not wrong to be, it's not bad to be wrong. Um, but, but you need to first ignore, but then check up with existing literature. Um, so it's, I remember when we did the, the ranking system, we actually didn't even know what ELO stand for, and ELO was kind of a known ranking, uh, quite a well-known ranking system. The third one is that when you work on a technology transfer, you're working on an engineering process, not on a research process. Research process is an annual process. The conferences run every year. So when the deadline comes for the call for papers, that's an important milestone. Products take probably many, some, some products take several years, and the, and the milestones in the, in the engineering process, um, you know, they, they, they're, they're therefore reducing risk. You come in with a new unproven technology, you introduce risk. So understand the engineering process, something that was extremely important. Um, the fourth one, something that I, I, I can't emphasize strongly enough, is um, write the code. Don't just write the equations. Like a lot of the code you saw there wasn't written by someone else. It's written by, by us two, uh, us three, that did the work, that did both the, the science and the, um, and the analysis. Um, simplicity, I think, is very important. Um, it's very tempting when you develop, uh, let's say, something that I just showed, to go into tangents and have even more complex nonlinear estimators. Um, the systems need to be explainable. Like it, it's important that it's not just important they're accurate. They also need to be easy to understand. And then the long run, I can't stress this one long enough. Um, initially, you know, it takes about two to three months, I would say, um, when you have a good idea to to make a mathematical insight or what we call breakthrough. But it doesn't I have not seen any major product taking two to three months to go out. It's always the long run. It, it's years and that's okay. There's a you know if, if th there's nothing to be gained by by quick win throw over the throw the fence kind of model. So from the machine learning perspective, um, the kind of six steps that that you've always follow um, and have always followed is you first get your data, then you model it, and I've I've kind of went a little through that. Then you learn a model with a with an implementation of a or or an implementation of an of an algorithm that you came up with or you you used. Then you go into a cycle of engineering features. Um, meaning the results weren't as accurate as you hoped, so you go back and change some of the ways that the algorithm perceives the data, um, probably remove some outliers. Then you need to go into a mode of measuring how accurate is it. You know, beta test is an extreme form of measuring, um, but it's a possible one. A-B test is a more, uh, more common one, so you, you have already a platform where for some parts of your users, you can, or for some parts of your product, you can use a different system B, and then you have a compare treatment uh, control group A, for, for the equally sized group, and then you need tools to support it when it actually goes in operation. Now, uh, I think, from my experience, this is the six essential steps. The only mistake in that picture is they look like they take an equal amount of time, but my experience is more like this, that the machine learning takes about the smallest amount of time, um, and even getting data, um, getting data in from the processes. Most of the data generating processes are not meant to be used as input for an adaptive system. It takes takes among the longest time, and then and the cycle of engineering the, the features so it actually makes a makes a substantial difference in the accuracy um, takes an equally equally uh, uh, equally similar large large amount of time. Um, and the last the last thing I I want to just uh, just sort of word of caution of not using machine learning everywhere. Um, what is the what is the questions that I always ask myself when, when, when people say, well, let's, let's, let's use machine learning for this. I'm sure it's going to get better. Um, the first question is data. Do we even have sufficient ongoing data or, or not? Um, I'll give you an example of a problem where we have, and then a problem where, which is attacked by machine learning methods. But I would say that doesn't make much sense. There's no ongoing data, and the total amount of instances is in the hundreds, so you can do it by hand. Second is it complexity. Is, Perhaps, can we, can we define a simple rule that we just write down that does the prediction, that does the filling in of future values accurate enough? Um, and even there is a good example where, where that happens and it gets ignored. 
The third one I always ask is, even if we build this adaptive experiences in, is the customer actually going to like it, or is it just technically cute? Um, and can, can the customer ex benefit from it? And the fourth one is, is it economical? I think that's something that often gets overlooked. Is Does the cost of doing a prediction outweigh the benefit? Okay. So here's, an, here's a bunch of examples that I just talked through where I think it makes sense. Click-through rate prediction, ongoing stream of data. This is people constantly getting content. They see content and they click or they don't click. They buy a product or they don't buy a product. They go to this web page or they don't. They like a Facebook post or they don't. That keeps on going. This is like people living, people interacting with living objects. Uh, forecasting demand. People always, this is another good example. They buy um, a simple rule for what's the future going to be, uh, how many of these clickers are going to get bought. That's not something where, simple, where you can define a simple rule. Um, and there's uh, economics in there. Um, named entity extraction from, from texts and from books or from the web. It's a big problem because people continue to generate, con uh, generate language. They generate knowledge. And that knowledge doesn't stop magically. Um, or, or fraud prediction. Um, it's just incentive driven. Here's a, here's a bad example uh, with, that actually happens. So one of the prime problems in machine learning that many, many PhD theses have been written on is predicting the type of a flower. So is this an iris or is this a, a petula? And now this is cute, but honestly, the, the type of flowers is a limited set. I would upper bound it by 1,000. And classifying them is something that I can get a, uh, someone that's well trained to do. And I don't really see there's an ongoing stream. I don't really see the complexity. So saying that, um, the IRIS data set is one of the, oh, as a mushrooms data set as well. It's one of the standard data sets where whole, whole uh, lives of uh, machine learning researchers decide one way or the other by being a little better. Um, complexity. So one of the common techniques here is um, when you have a data set and somehow, this happens a lot, uh, some column of data is missing. It's just it, it wasn't logged or it went missing. What some people do as a technique is they impute it. So what that means is as a simple rule, like let's take the average of the five records above and fill in those values. Well, if I fill in something that's as simple as sum the five numbers that are available above in the table, why would I need a machine learning system to learn that rule? I, I, I know that rule. The rule is the average of the five numbers above. So that's not really something where machine learning systems can do any better. The best thing it can do is it can learn to average the five numbers above. Um, customer experience, um, probably a bit biased, but predictive menus. I don't know how many people know what that is. When a, when a menu, like a file menu, goes and optimizes the placement of according to the choices you made in the past. Definitely doable, definitely learnable. Um, is it a great customer experience when the file open menu changes position depending? I did not like that. I think that's one example where ML is doable. We have ongoing data, but the customer experience dimension hasn't been thought through. And economics, uh, it's a good example. So in online advertising, there is like huge, huge shifts now. And, and there's methods that are much more computationally hard than what I described, like neural network methods. But one thing not to forget is that in, in online advertising, you're talking about extremely thin, uh, small, amounts of, of, uh, small amounts of ads that get clicked. Yet for everything, every ad that might get clicked, you need to perform some computation. Computation cost. Computation have cost. Cost in the, in, in, the, in the distribution, in the, in the networking, and cost in memory, and cost in CPU. So if your model gets more costly, if your computation of an ad, decide to show it or not, is more costly than what an average you make from an ad, you actually have no more business model. You, have a, you might be more accurate, but you no longer have a business that will sustain in the long run. Um, so it's actually something that uh, is often kind of uh, overlooked when you, look at the, when you look at the application of machine learning. So I hope in the last uh, 58 minutes, I, uh, I convinced you somewhat that technology transfer can be a highly rewarding and, and interesting, interesting experience. Um, what I found is that uh, practical problems actually emerge out of this. So some of the problems, for example, the dampening one, wasn't easy, or, or even the, the, the smoothing. Th these, were, these were research directions that I think otherwise I wouldn't, wouldn't have ever engaged in and, and started. Uh, hopefully, I also convinced you a little bit that the the pictures you saw, so they're known as graphical models, um, they're powerful as a language because they're good for modeling, they're easy to explain, they actually lead to an algorithm. I basically ran, developed the algorithm here, um, and they're highly modular, so something that encoding is a good thing. So I highly encourage you to look at that code, um, then you see that literally, you know, I wasn't lying. I was simply putting the modules together like the red arrows. 
Um, and the last word is, uh, what is machine learning? In my view, after having done it for 15, 16 years, I'd say it's, uh, it's the statistics of big data. Thanks. Is there any questions? This one up there. Hi. Hi. What was the impact of using F Sharp as your uh, language of choice? And also, why did you pick it so early in 2007, 8, when it was still a pretty young technology? Yeah. Um, the impact was that uh, it made it a lot easier to translate the mathematical models into code that ran at production speed. Um, so we, we had a shorter time. You saw these little blocks of code coding. They were, they were shorter than, um, I would argue, had we used a more traditional language. Because it really allowed th this ability to not change state. I mean, that's something that's inherent in mathematics. So when you write x equals 1, you can't, you know, that, that fixes the value of x. That's not going to mean in the next line I can use x as a placeholder for 2. Um, that's a property that OCaml or Sharp have. So I hope that answers your first question. It minimizes them. The second question, why did we use it so early? In all honesty, because um, we had the architect of F-Sharp as a colleague down the corridor. So if I needed a language feature, I just went there and asked him. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> so uh, one more subsequent question, maybe. Uh, would you recommend big data people to look more into functional programming languages? Yeah, yeah definitely. I think in particular when it comes to distributing uh, the computation, um, not having to worry about sta changing state is a, is a big savior. So, Thank you very much. Yeah. So we're playing with Scala these days. And so uh, I have a question for you, which is, or speaker? Ah, okay. Is if you uh, you think Iris is an unreasonable data set to use, uh, do you have data that you make public to solve that problem? Yes, um, we do. Um, when it's when it's either old enough um, or not or anonymized enough so you can use it. So I'll give the example of the ranking system here. That data, the Halo 2 beta of 6,000, this was 6,000 people playing 160,000 matches, it's actually publicly available. Um, Where? Uh, you, you just query for Halo 2 beta data set. Um, but I can, we can make it, why don't we put it on the buzzwords page, um, if it's a link to it. It's the, tricky, the tricky bit, probably just to answer, um, one other tricky bit, and it's not, I don't have an answer for this, but I think uh, when, you, when you release data about people, you really have to honor their privacy. So uh, I'm very, I, would, I would be, you know, I'd, I'd be very reluctant to release something that identifies any individual's taste or preference or, um, or, 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 a, or buying pattern or, or any kind of information that identifies an individual. That makes it hard. So my criticism of Iris didn't, didn't imply to mean that uh, I have an answer to how to make these huge collections easily available. Um, probably one last word. There is a lot of, th there is a lot of data that's anonymized enough also available um, about the census. So the, the UK, the US, the census data sets have some very interesting data sets about people on an aggregated level that are, that are practically relevant. There's another, there's uh, another question. question. question up here. Hi. On the upper right. Do you see me? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, I sort, um, sort of consider myself to be a machine learner, although I'm sort of at the beginning of my career. I just finished university. Yeah. And um, now I saw that you do saw, uh, oh, it's very strange with the feedback. <laughs> um, I, know, I know. I noticed that you do. <laughs> two things that I do as well, but I considered uh, mistakes by myself. And I thought about changing the way I do things. And, uh, but now I see that you do actually the same. And the one thing is that uh, you first build models and afterwards do the looking, um, you look into literature. Yeah. And um, yeah, I do the same, but I thought it was actually bad style and I considered changing that. And the second thing I'm doing as well is first building the model and then thinking about the features that I want to use. And then I also thought 
maybe I should first think about the features and then the build the model. Um, but it kind of felt natural to do it that way, but I thought maybe it's a bad practice. But now maybe can, you can substantiate uh, why this is actually not just practical, but also theoretically useful to do it this supposedly wrong way. So, so the first question, I think it's, it's almost self-evident. If you want to come up with, a, um, with an algorithm or with a model that is not known before, how can you come up with it if you read the known literature? You, you're, you're likely going to follow the same thought pattern and, and thought traps that others did. Now, what's bad practice is not to read the literature at all. That's bad practice. So <laughs> yeah, sure, I'd I encourage you to, yeah. to go, follow your hunch, follow your gut, try this idea, and then see. And there is a, there's going to be some surprise. Sometimes, you, well, quite often, you find that someone else had a similar idea before. So in terms of publication, you might not be able to publish. But in terms of generating a, a good customer experience or a product, that's, that's actually a good thing, because you have a deep understanding. The second thing, um, doing feature engineering after the modeling. The model often, what a model often does, it encodes relationship between the data items that you know from the data generating process. If, regardless of how, you, how the features are, how the, is how the algorithm sees, sees your instance, your, your objects. So when I represent a, a, you know, a user, a web searcher by client IP, I can't learn anything about what males and, and females do, because like, that's not the level at which the algorithm sees it. But the model is often, for example, the model is often encoding a, an inherent property or constraint on the data. So in the ranking example, it's the simple, it's the simple fact that there is a ordering. So if one, there's a transitivity. If the winning team is better than the second winning team, and that team is better than the third winning team, then by transitivity, the first winning team is better than the third, third winning team. Right? And that's effectively what you encode. That's what I would call a model, regardless of how you represent the, the players. So to me, also, the other, the other reason why it's hard um, to engineer features before you do the model is you often, you often uh, engineer features with respect to where there is still a, uh, a structure, a, a, a mistake, a residual that has structure in the data after you make a fit. But you, can know, you can't know this unless you have a model from which you can derive a learning algorithm. So a very good way of doing feature engineering is to look at, you do a run, and then you look at all the examples where you still make mistakes, where, you still re where the algorithm still is really bad, really inaccurate. And you see if there's anything structurally interesting. But that step of, of studying requires that you first run the algorithm. How can you engineer features without being able to run a learning algorithm? How can you derive a learning algorithm without having a model of the data? Does that make sense? Yeah, it's basically you say um, you need to have a model in order to find out um, where there are correlations between input and output. Yep, that's right. Okay. I saw someone there. Yeah. It's kind of hard to see because there's like four big lights. <laughs> Hi, sorry. Um, I had a question which was about uh, the matchmaking example, and yeah. it was uh, kind of detailed somehow, but I was very curious. Like, uh, uh, how you showed it, and um, in the model, you, of course, were assessing in a game people losing and winning, yeah. and what how it will impact. But uh, if you take a game, sometimes you have also the problem of people leaving or yep. being disconnected by the game. And, uh, well, they get probably a loss, but this also impacts the game because the other people will probably lose. And then if you compare two games, maybe they, lose, they look similar because those people lost <laughs> there and there, but in the first case, they played a bad game, bad impacted game. And uh, well, this is also a cause of bad matchmaking and the opposite, because if I get matched by people that I don't like for some reason, then I leave and then uh, I will get matched again badly and blah, blah. So I was just wondering whether this was a problem that you faced or not. Or we did, a... we did. And we did several things around that. So one of them you can see here, um, it says game quality. See that? Can you read that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if the game quality is high, then the percentage of information that's taken is high too. Okay? But if the game quality is low, 
meaning someone left the game. So now you have three versus four. Oh. So three versus four is known to be a bad match. Yeah. Then we basically gradually start to ignore uh, the, the game. Okay. So you play it to the end, you have your experience, but it's not going to affect your skill. Secondly, and I was simplifying a little bit in the interest of time, the model itself also has a way that you can say partial, partial play. So the API uh, okay. supports for the developer to submit what fraction of game time was that gamer present in the session. And if that was 1%, then their skill only participated 1%. Okay. Now, it's, it still doesn't fully address it, because some games, um, um, you know, partial participation in a game doesn't mean that, you're not can, that you can't be game deciding. Um, so the game developer really has to, that's, that's something where the explanation is necessary. We just make the simplifying assumption, if you're present 1% of the game, then your skill is exactly 1% represented yeah. the overall skill of the team. Some games lend themselves to this. For example, games where you accumulate points, so you shoot people, so you, if you're only there for the first minute, you can't shoot that many. Yeah. But a racing game, it makes no difference. Let's say you have team racing, um, and yeah. the fastest in the team determines the winning of the team. Yeah. It doesn't matter if like, everyone drops out but the fastest player, the team is still super strong. Um, and then also the, the assumption of some of the skills is reflective of the sum of the, of the skill of the team is not true anymore. So this assumption is a simplifying assumption for mathematical and practical reasons. It's not always uh, the best one for every game type. But uh, in your experience, it uh, worked okay? Like, uh... it, work, it worked particularly okay, I would say, in games that where, you accum where the teams accumulate scores, mm. whether it's like territory or kills or, or, or money. Um, you know, it's like some, some form of game of, uh, you know, you, not territory, but you, you build up the city of wealth and together. Th those it works really well. What doesn't work really well is if a single player can dominate the skill of a team. Um, so in, in a shooting game, there's one example. Um, one game is called snipers, so everyone has a sniper. There, the best player can, even if everyone else is around them, can actually, the, one player can decide the whole team match because it's, so, it's, it's focused on such a small event. Um, so, for, for games where scores accumulate, it works really well. Okay, thanks. Hey. Hey. I really liked um, what you were saying about the operational tooling, because I think that's um, putting the end control of the results back into the hands of a human, right, yeah. rather than the algorithm. And um, I was wondering who is uh, developing and maintaining uh, the operational tooling? Is that also owned by the researchers, or are these different groups? In, no, it's different groups, actually. That's more engineering op uh, operations team um, with lots of documentation and a deep understanding of what's going on. So it takes a year. I mean, it takes really, I want to say one year, but it takes a long time for, for people to understand. Also, a lot of writing up. It's effectively, now, you type through skill into, into a web search, in your favorite web search engine, you get 10,000 pages, hits, and you get several tutorials. And there's other people have written very nice exposés at every level of understanding. And that's necessary, I think, for, for other teams, new team members that are more in engineering and operation, that are also good in op operations, um, to be able to, to support such a system. So the ultimate tech transfer really means that it actually establishes itself as a base technology and has enough literature around it so that people can acquire that knowledge. That, that's even longer. That's probably another three to five years, okay, in, my, in my experience. I have a question regarding TrueSkill. Um, for me, it's kind of concern. Is it uh, this score transitive? I mean, that if player <laughs> A plays better than B, it's not, and B is better than C, it's not always the case, I think. Especially, I think, for strategic gaming and stuff like this. It's, that's true. It's not always the case. And it's something um, that, we, that you can somewhat address. Um, but the problem is it's not transitive. That's, now I'm going back more to information theory. You're, you're, you're a little bit at loss, because if it's not transitive, it means, for example, soccer is not transitive. Um, that's why every team in the, in the Bundesliga or Premier League plays against every team twice in a season. Because, um, you know, I don't know, like, I don't want to pick teams here. I'm going to get into hell if I do that. But team, yeah, yeah, sure, I'm going to pick Hertha and Bayern. No, if team A beats team B doesn't, and B beats C in, in soccer, uh, it does not at all mean that C is now going to lose against A. 
Um, the problem is that when you have n players in a league, um, so these, they, they, and they play against n players, you need n square numbers that somewhat represent the chance of one winning against the other. If, if you don't have transitivity, you need those numbers. So that means in order to get the best matchmaking experience, every player has to somewhat play against everyone else. You cannot transfer any information. The reason why this learned so fast is that if you have n players um, and there's transitivity, that means you just need to learn an ordering of n players. An ordering of n players is one of n factorial many permutations. This number sounds pretty big, but it actually isn't that big when you think of it in bits. Because I just said it's n squared bits, so the number of bits of n factorial, so log of n factorial, is n log n, like quicksort. Um, quicksort exploits this as well, transitivity. So that's why, it's actually a link between Truskin and Quicksort. Um, so that's why, on average, per player, you only need log n games. So with a league of a million players, that's like, you know, 20 games, right? A thousand is 10 bits, another thousand is 10 bits. The reason why this can learn so fast is the transitivity. So if you have a game that is intransitive, then the only way to really get, get a ranking system that is, from an information theory point of view, that is somewhat fair is the, is the sort of um, leaderboards that roll up, what we do in, uh, in the World Championship now, where we have 60 teams competing, and then the winner of each of the groups is going to play against the winner. So you build a ladder rather than a system that relies on transitivity. So it's an interesting problem what to do with, with almost intransitivity, meaning you're transitive except for a few exceptions. But if, if, you, assume, if you really drop the assumption, you can't design a system that works for millions of people. Because then everyone has to play against a million people, and there's not enough time to do that. I have a question on, uh, did you measure the satisfactions of the gamers with the system being launched, and how did you do that, and whether you include it at the end uh, to the design of the system? So I would say there is aspects of matchmaking that we absolutely don't do and do bad, which is playing with your mates. Like This system requires that um, the outcome of the match is a function of the skills, so no setting up games or messing around. So what it, what it drives is very, com very competitive gaming. Um, what's missing from, a, from the online gaming experience with this system, what it's not covering at all, is the social matchmaking. Um, has it been successful? We would say yes, simply measured by the um, uptake and by how many people came back after they finished the campaign and played. Like, you know, that number is known, how many people came back and played ranked matches versus non-ranked matches. And the one picture you saw is actually a show, it was actually a graph. Um, let me see if I find it quickly. Um, yeah. So here, um, one thing we could also do is we could select, uh, it's hard to read, but we could select if we want player match that was social or ranked match. See that? There's an event. Did the people play a ranked match that was the true skill, or did they play what we call player match or social match would be the more modern term today. So we, we had good sense of how many people picked to play with their friends, where, where the matchmaking was just by what they, who they picked to play with, and how many people picked, I want to play against the, you know, someone of my skill. And the, simply the uptake by people was a success indicator, uh, was an indicator of success. Hey. Uh, there, uh, Where? Ah. Upright. Oh man, you directly in the light. No, nope. this, this side. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so my question is more about uh, the organizational point of view, because uh, so I'm working also in research transfer at XRC. I guess you know because you work with Ono. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> yeah, I so, know Ono. I think that the biggest problem that we have in research is that you always have uh, groups of research and group of engineers, yeah. and sometimes it's very difficult to uh, try to fill in that gap. So I wanted to know how do you work usually when you are with engineers and researchers? I f I might, this, is, this, is simply, this is basically my experience. In my experience, you try to minimize that gap by not shying away from taking a, taking a task on and work on it. Like, in, you know, embed yourself. Like in the case of Bungie, I was actually 
um, we were actually flying and just worked for a whole week just to get it started in the engineering team set with the engineers take, take bugs and take tasks um, and, and start to fix them, even though they weren't any research, they weren't necessarily the, the code that was driving that feature we would like to get, like to get in. So that's one so social level, work together. A second one, you make code the linga franca and not mathematics. So I've been showing a lot of graphs and mathematics, but you, when you work with the together, you don't sort of provide a research report. You provide an implementation of it. Um, not the full-blown system and design of it, but the core that implements the update of the parameters or the predictions. Um, so that's something I think that, that these two things have personally helped me a great deal. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we're going to cut it here, um, unless we have time for one more question. Um, I would like to have a question. Well, how much time do you spend um, compared to like developing in breaking the system yourself? <laughs> in like, breaking, <laughs> I mean, it's very important when you work with distributed systems, software, and APIs that you you know you you deal over something that's hard to break. Um, how much time do you think, or how much time did you spend into breaking it? Tough. It's an interesting question. Um, so I take it as a how much time do we spend in in testing the border cases of it? Yeah. Um, in this, in the experiences I have, because they were live systems they were easily found by, by users. Um, and so it was more, I think the question is more how much time that we, so I take it as how much time that we have to spend on fixing issues that um, we hadn't thought of before because they were corner cases and they, they just surfaced. Um, so one good example here is um, when you do this, when you, do, when you run this code, this update code, there is a scenario, and it happens rarely, it happens one in a million times, that you win a game and your skill goes down. And that's mathematically correct. <laughs> now, you know, I thought this was impossible, but about uh, three, four months in, this actually happened to a person, and they went to a, uh, a board. So I spent a lot of time looking at the boards of all the problems that people have, and and found out. Um, so this is a, it's a guy that I friended then on Xbox Live. He's genuine. I looked at the record. It's true. His skill did go down, and that costs quite a bit of time to understand why. And and it actually. So the reason, just to explain why that was, is. Um, a little thing I didn't tell you about, um, that's not a big detail, um, but in matches, we assume that the skill can change. So we basically in reintroduce dynamics, meaning that my skill now and my skill in the next match have the same mean, but one has larger variance. So that if, if I really get better, I can go up. If I really get worse, I go down. Otherwise, my, my uncertainty would just, the uncertainty in the system would just go down, 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 and I would be locked in and never move again. So in this case, he played a game where it was clear he was going to win. Um, so there was no information provided in the game, so his mean stayed the same. Yes, he won, but it was a like, marginally fifth digit change. But because of the shift in, because of the dynamics, the change of uncertainty over time, the variance increased. So now if you remember the equation, mean minus three times variance, mean stays the same, variance increases, so his skill went down visibly. Um, so how much time? Well, this cost a fair, you know, this, in this particular example, this cost a week to fix this. Um, but Trying to break ourselves, it, no more than, I mean, you know, in the systems we develop now or here, we have unit tests for the individual algorithm where we have input output, but then we have also integration tests where we take large collections, like the large collections you saw there, and run it through and see how many, you know, how many jobs fail, how many jobs. But that, I wouldn't call this a full user test, as you probably allude to. So. I, I, was, I was more into like the whole testing and Yeah, and so testing, we do unit thing. tests. Um, um, we do, you know, documentation is extremely important, particularly when the methods are not standard, not textbook. You have to over-document, in the code even. Otherwise, what is, that, what is that doing? There's not even a reference literature otherwise. And then we do integration tests where we have huge collections of inputs, so old game records or old click records, and run them through. Um, with, and the integration tests have then probabilistic tests, meaning because they, you can't guarantee the execution order, you can only guarantee that the, the parameters you compute are within bounds uh, with respect to what, you, what you've done once. So you, because the order of execution isn't the same, you can't just check for exact equality of the results. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you.